going live on Facebook? Okay, cool. All right. I think there's a couple more people um, that are going. All right, there's people still joining us. We'll give it a couple of minutes and then we'll we'll give it a minute or so and then we'll make a start. Let's check if everybody's on Facebook. So if you've just joined on Facebook, um, <clears throat> thank you very much for um, joining. We're just waiting for a couple more people to join us in the Zoom call and then we're going to start proceedings for this evening and just give you a little bit of explanation about how things are going to go um, and introduce you very quickly to the um, contributors and then we're going to, um, I'm going to talk through some uh, the course and um, the how things are going to unfold. So let me just make sure that nobody else is cool. And then we're going to start proceedings for this evening. Okay, cool. All right, we've got people joining. Excellent. All right, so let's get comfortable. All right. All right, let's just hit record. All right. Okay, good evening all. Welcome to the Relabeling Reactivity Symposium 2021. Thank you very much for those that have come along and attending either via the Zoom call or on Facebook. Just to make you aware that on Facebook, there is a slight delay from me giving um, like speaking on Zoom and then it coming out on Facebook. There's a sort of a very brief amount of uh, delay. So if you post a question on Facebook, I will pick it up, but just be mindful of that, just to reiterate that point. The, about the event will be recorded and it will be posted on um, uh, my social media and on uh, YouTube shortly after this, once I've edited the um, footage. So don't panic if you uh, don't feel you're gonna miss anything out, etc. It will remain on my Facebook page, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so don't worry about um, taking copious notes. You can come back and review it. And obviously the content will be um, available for you guys to pick up later on. So the premise of Relabeling Reactivity um, and this symposium was to get the people that have contributed to the online course that will be released next week. So as of Monday, the actual online training will be released and it will be available for um, people to uh, join and to, uh, to get involved with. But tonight, it's really about introducing to the people that have contributed and also to give a little bit of insight into how this project came together and the thinking behind it, all right? So I'm just gonna take some of these guys off spotlight so I can bring myself up onto, so I'm gonna just shut these down for a second. Let me just my, and then I'll come back to these in a second. Okay, so firstly, as I say, thank you very much for everybody's interest in this project. It's been quite overwhelming to have your messages and emails and um, PMs and DMs about your experiences with having a reactive dog. and sharing that with me and I absolutely am, am, am honored that you would share some you know private information about your dog and your experience and how it's affected you and it brings me on to the final point of what one of the contributing factors to reactivity so uh, obviously this week I have been doing various lives um talking about the the various entities that can affect reactivity and that can contribute to reactivity I should say so earlier in the week I discussed about genetics and um, I talked about how that can be an impact and how a lot of dogs it can have a predisposition to behavior that could evolve or, or become reactive. Um, and that's something that we need to be mindful of with our dogs and understanding that dogs were originally designed for a purpose and we need to be mindful of that and, and be respectful of that within the dog and also adapt our, um, uh, our mindset and our perceptions of what dogs should be as opposed to what they are and therefore hopefully help them avoid developing problematic behavior. Second entity I discussed about was socialization and the importance of appropriate socialization, thinking of socialization as a series of lessons within themselves. It's critically important to have a dog that is robust and well-rounded and confident that we perceive the life experiences they have as educational points. So when I have a puppy, I'm very mindful of the exposure they have, whether that's a puppy, whether it's an older dog, whether it's a rescue dog, whether it's a, um, a rehome dog or a dog that I've bred myself or a dog that I've got from the breeder, it really doesn't matter. Every experience I have with that dog, I really take a lot of care about thinking about what are they going to be um, experiencing? What are they going to be learning? How are they going to respond? And observing their 
body language and so forth and so forth to try and create a positive experience and a learning experience for that dog that it can um it can glean from and it can grow from and become a well-rounded adjust a well-balanced dog so that's really really important to remind yourself um, of, of the necessity to keep your socialization appropriate to where your dog is in its in its development and obviously dogs will all develop at varying stages and it's important that we consider that i'm just gonna bear with me one second just so i make sure i've got this on the board i'm going to Okay. okay so um just sorry i was just playing around with the recording there just to make sure that i've recorded it in several various forms so i don't miss any of this when we we populate it so um genetics and socialization are two entities that can affect a dog developing issues that are deemed as reactive the reason that i keep referring to reactivity in that manner is i'm urging everybody to rethink the concept of reactivity as not this label that should be placed on your dog as a sense of shame and a shroud of shame, but as something that um, we can break down and we can redefine how we perceive our own dogs. One of the things that definitely uh, is consistent when I've worked with people that have dogs that have been labeled as reactive is the, the conflict between how they feel about the dog and how society feels about the dog and how almost that they um, take on what other people's perceptions about their dog and they desperately want to show the world that their dog is a model citizen, it's confident, it's a great dog, it's happy, it's intelligent, even though initially that might be in the home environment or in certain situations, they want the dog to, uh, to grow and move forward and to show that to the wider world. And, and there's, I'm gonna introduce you to one of my students, um, Patricia, who really, really talks about that in the greater detail. So socialization and genetics are two contributing factors that could, result in behavior that is qualified or deemed as reactive. The third entity that I discussed was understanding. So when we're talking about understanding, that's really where it falls on our shoulders to um, ensure that we are educating our dog to behave and um, act in a way that's appropriate uh, in various situations and not focusing on stopping our dogs doing something as opposed to focusing on what we do want them to do. So. What do we want our dog to do when it sees the fast moving thing in front of it? What do we want our dog to do when it sees another dog? And it comes back to the socialization entity. So it's really critically important that we evaluate our dog's understanding constantly in order to um, ensure that we are um, inputting constantly into their training and that we are creating a dog that has good social skills and we have some level of control. That can greatly underpin the dog's confidence and our confidence. If we feel that when the dog is off lead, we can't get them back in a, uh, 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 promptly. So what's gonna then happen is that's gonna create a level of anxiety within us, which is gonna feed into the dog and so forth and so forth. So it's really, really important that we consider understanding. And again, when we are evaluating each of our behaviors, we are asking ourselves that question of, would I be happy to wage a thousand pounds on this dog's behavior? So if I was to ask you now, those of you watching at home, um, would you wager a thousand pounds that your dog understands to sit to down and to do a recall? And if you are questioning that level of confidence or that reliability, that's where we're first gonna um, work on um, creating better understanding and filling that gap. We want that level of confidence so that when we take our dogs out into the real world, and that's what relabeling reactivity is very much about, we are equipping ourselves with um, tools and um, skills that we know are going to have a level of um, reliability, irrespective of the environment, irrespective of the distraction, irrespective of the circumstances. OK, so genetics, socialization and understanding. Those are critical um, key elements. The fourth thing I discussed was physicality, considering the dog's physical needs, both in terms of their welfare and their well-being. So ensuring that as uh, a high drive dog, which often are the type that are predisposed to reactive behavior, we're satisfying and creating contentment within that dog. Additionally to that, that we're ensuring that the dog's reactivity or behavior that's deemed reactive isn't as a result of an underlying physical issue. And it's really, really critically important that we are, we are making regular checks to ensure that our dogs are healthy and well in themselves and there isn't an underlying issue. Classic sign of a dog that could have an underlying physical issues if the dog um, suddenly develops 
reactivity, okay? Um, and that's a really classic sign or indication that there could be something physically going on with the dog. As I explained previously, you know what I'm sure most of you can relate. If you have toothache, if you have a headache, if you have a sore back, if you have a sore pain within your body, how that can affect your, your you know, you're probably going to be irritable with your family members or at work, et cetera. You're going to have a shorter fuse. So it's really, really important that you um, take the, um, the dog's overall well-being as a, a, a holistically. We are looking at not only the dog's physical well-being in terms of health, but also um, the dog's uh, appeasing, uh, sorry, satisfying, I should say, their um, needs and wants. A lot of dogs that are predisposed to reactive behavior can often have um, a, a desire to, uh, I perceive their needs as almost insulin if they were a diabetic. It's not even just a necessity, it's, it's a daily requirement. They need that outlet for that energy. It doesn't have to be, you know, taking a ball and throwing it on a chuck it over the park. It needs to be, you need to be innovative and creative within what you do with them. Take them to, um, you know, a wooded area so they can investigate some nice smells, take them to somewhere where there's a slight incline so they can work a bit more physically. Um, take them to a, an area where they can have a good blast and they can really out, uh, let, um, have a real good blowout with the, you know, really sprint and work off some of that, those, um, you know, hyperactive feelings. Um, and also take them to somewhere where they can have a good old mooch. And I like to create that variety with my own dogs. Okay. So the fifth entity that can often create reactivity, and it brings us on to um, the main entity of, or one of the key areas within relabeling reactivity, and that is relationship with our dog. And relationship could be broken down into many, many subsections. Um, and the key thing that can affect relationship is if there is a trauma that has been experienced between you or the dog. So often when people have um, a dog that has behavior that is perceived by others reactive, there is a stigma attached to it. And there is a, um, a, a sense of shame in owning or that ilk of dog or the dog behaving in a way that's deemed by others in, as inappropriate, or that could in, even not deemed, but isn't inappropriate. Um, and it's really, really um, important that we understand that there's a connection between the relationship um, that we have with our dog in terms of if we're feeling a level of anxiety, the dog's going to pick up on that. If we're feeling um, a little bit um, concerned about a situation, the dog's going to pick on that. And that might sound obvious, but it's something that can often be overlooked with a lot of approaches to training and that we solely focus on the dog and not enough on the person, the well-being of the person. The other entity that the other issue that can often be created is when the dog experiences something like, for example, your dog um, behaves inappropriately towards another dog um, and the owner, you know, responds in a way that most of us do in a protective manner. And they respond and they give you, you know, some verbal abuse or they point the finger and they're like, you're, they accuse your dog of being dangerous. It should be muzzled. It shouldn't be out in public, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are classic um, um, phrases that are thrown in people's faces when their dog behaves as dogs often and can do. That can create a level of trauma with the person. And it's a classic cycle that can uh, that occur and that that person, if they are not of a, um, uh, if they're not of a disposition where they can just dust it off and move it on, move on, they can certainly be affected by that experience. And that can in itself create a level of um, uh, trauma within that person and so almost PTSD. So they go out into public almost being um, overly cautious or anxious about the possibility of experiencing that and revisiting that. The other variation is if the dog, if they see their dog behaving in a way, for example, in a, an aggressive manner or in a, in a, in that red zone is, you know, commonly the phrase used where the dog is, you know, they can't connect with the dog. They can't reach the dog that can also create that level of trauma within them. And that can affect the relationship that you have with the dog and therefore subsequently contribute to the dog's reactive behavior. Where relabeling reactivity, the online course is unique is that that is something that as a professional I've observed when I've worked with extensively with people with dogs with problematic behavior. I have noticed consistently that whilst I can impact the dog's training and I can teach them core skills, the massive entity of changing the behavior for um, and having a long lasting impact is supporting the owner, guardian, handler, trainer in their um, concerns about the dog. So that would be giving them the skills to navigate through situations and to, um, to deal with the, the trauma, et cetera, that can be 
impacting their dog's confidence and, and also allowing them or giving them the skills to be able to move through that and hopefully regain their confidence so that they can affect the dog's um, overall well-being. There is So one of the things that I considered and I reached out for was people that could help handlers and guardians and trainers with that entity of it. Whilst I'm a dog trainer and formerly, obviously, I was a, um, in a profession which worked quite intensively in, in, with people that had experienced trauma, I wanted to ask people that had um, that was their vocation and that was their 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 role. And they had also um, done it in a very specific capacity. So one of the unique things about this course is that I've asked um, contributors that have a background in self-care, well-being, and also a uh, mental health to contribute to this course. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna give you um, um, that as a lead-in, but we're gonna meet them later on. Um, and the other aspect that's unique to enabling reactivity is looking at the dog's behavior holistically. So it isn't just about teaching the dog core skills like sitting down. What are we gonna do moving forward to provide an outlet for that dog that's healthy? And I've asked a very good friend of mine who I'm going to introduce formally later on to contribute, contribute, I should say, an entity that um, about nose work and scent work and man trailing um, to provide an active, um, an activity for your dogs that are reactive, that is safe, that is healthy, that is low impact, that isn't going to be physically um, um, potentially dangerous for them. You know, some of the other activities that you can do with the dog can often be a little bit more fast and furious, which is going to create that adrenaline. We want something that the dog's um, going to have to use their brain a little bit more. So nose work is a natural route for that. So again, just about one of the other contributors, and I'm going to um, let the, and formally introduce them later on. But the a huge entity that can definitely affect um, reactivity, reactivity or reactive behavior is the relationship that we have with our dogs and that level of trauma that can often be um, that can often affect us uh, and therefore affect the dog's behavior. So I wanted to share with you at this point, a student that I had, or I have, I should say, um, called Patricia. Patricia and her dog Spike have, I've been training them for a considerable amount of time now. And there is so much that um, about Patricia's story and, and her husband Ian and Spike's that I'm sure that will you guys will resonate with and connect with. So. Patricia unfortunately couldn't make this evening, um, but I'm going to share with you um, an interview I did with her this afternoon. It's probably about half an hour, so bear with me whilst I play the video. I'm going to share my screen with you guys and allow you to see that video and listen to some of the things that Patricia and I um, discussed and spoke of. Um, the Just to explain, so I have did a Zoom call with um, uh, Patricia this afternoon. We're all very well versed on Zoom. It's become like an added member of our family, but you will hear my voice speaking over, but you won't see my uh, my face in the, um, the frame. So it will be Patricia, Spike and Ian talking and me just interact, uh, 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 you'll hear my voice over. Um, I'm gonna play and let you, I'm gonna share my screen and play it and let you just listen to our conversation. And it was just a conversation about Spike, uh, about the journey that they went on as um, first time dog owners, and the eventual outcome. So hopefully, uh, and then I'll post this, obviously, once we've met all the relevant contributors, you can definitely ask questions. So save those to the, for the end um, so that you um, uh, that, that we don't get um, the flow of the conversation broken up by it, okay? So bear with me. I'm going to just share my screen. I'm gonna just bring up the video. Let's just bear with me. Okay, so. So hopefully, um, Dylan, can you see um, the video? Just give me a thumbs up. Cool. All right, excellent. I'm going to play. Um, and hopefully... So thank you all that have joined me on the Relabling Reactivity Symposium. And I wanted this opportunity to share with you the experience of some of the people that I've worked with. And the people who are sat across from the screen are, are very good friends and, and that went from being clients and students to now somebody that I would call and is definitely a friend, um, Patricia and her husband Ian and the dapper looking young fellow in the middle is Spike. I wanted to share with you and have this conversation with Patricia and Ian and I'm sure Spike will have a lot to say for himself, um, because they're somebody that originally found me as a result of having a dog that was labelled as reactive. And I know that's something that a lot of you that are watching this will resonate with and connect with. And I wanted you to hear firsthand from Patricia and her story of how um, um, it started with Spike 
and how um, the journey that they went on and what it ended up being and then moving forward. So first and foremost, thank you both for your time. I know that you're incredibly busy. Um, it, it, Patricia has a very busy job and she's forever um, in doing something. So I appreciate that this is a, um, you know, a, a rare opportunity to pin you down and to have this chance to talk to you. So first and foremost, how are you guys keeping you well? Yeah, very well, yeah. yeah busy in what you're doing so that's super so let's just jump straight into it and and hit the ground running so just tell us a little bit about um obviously spike spike is now is he 10 11 years old 11 bless his, 11 years young patricia 11 years young yeah. yeah and um and tell us a little bit about because spike was actually your the first dog you ever owned in your life wasn't it yeah so spike's our first dog and we got him at nine weeks old and what made you like what made you the process why did it take you so long to get a dog what made was it work commitments what how did that all come about yeah it was work yeah. and um traveling, traveling yeah. just, uh, just you know the, the chaos of modern life running a company yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then um, you just when you when you felt it was right to get a dog and you chose um, a mini schnauzer was there any particular reason why you went to that breed was it lifestyle again things like that yeah, lifestyle. I needed a dog that I could take with me on the tube or the train or the And that would fit, me, fit in the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is all, when people look for a dog, I think those are valid things to consider. And um, they get a dog that's going to suit the lifestyle and not always understanding fully what they could be signing up for because of the breed characteristics. I think sometimes that takes, you know, the experiences of owning one to really, really live in that um, and to experience full on. So what was your um, experience when you first got Spike? How did that um, pan out originally? Had that, can you remember back then? Yeah, well, we thought we were going to get this um, little dog that would be, you know, just hang out with us, be well behaved, fit into our life. Mm -hmm. And um, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, weeks old, his antisocial behaviour started early. Mm -hmm. um, he was mainly disruptive and reactive. He was scared of everything. The toaster, he was scared of us. Oh, really? Wow. Like a personal space of about 100 feet. <laughs> really? Go to the park and a dog 100 feet away would... He so, would bark so, hysterically. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Threatened by pretty much everything, and that 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 emerged. And no matter what we tried to do in terms of reassurance or you know, kind of listening to him and trying to work things out, it 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 didn't it didn't progress. It wasn't as he was going through. It was locked in. Mm. So how did that, at the time, so was that a somewhat of a culture shock then? Was that, I assume that wasn't what you were anticipating when you when you got a dog? Um, and the first time we went to the vet, the vet said, you know, this isn't normal with a puppy. You know, he's very shy and reserved and normally puppies bound into the surgery the first time. Mm -hmm. So as a, I mean, you know, you were a first time dog owner, never owning a dog before. Um, that must have been quite one. It must have been somewhat a shell shock to you. But how did it make? How did it affect the dynamics within the home? You know, was there discussion about are we going to keep the dog or should we send him back? Or were you always committed from the long haul? There was never uh, um, uh, like right, we're going to send him back. This is not for us, etc. Yeah, that wasn't an option from the beginning. We loved him, and we want to keep him. And, and I, you know, I have to say, he, he was very lovable. He's yeah. on. Uh, or within the family, round the, the, you know, the hearth, as it were, is mm -hmm. a lovely. Well, he was a lovely dog. He's affectionate and intelligent and smart. Yeah. On, but take him outside. Yeah. Or introduce any other element into it, and he became a different dog. Yeah. I think you've really, um, really brought up a couple of really pertinent points that a lot of people feel that with that have dogs that are deemed re reactive. So the first one is that um, you make that commitment to getting the dog, and often what you sign up for isn't necessarily what you end, uh, you end up. With. What you sign up for isn't what you envisage. That that could be down to you know your people's preconceived notions of what a dog should be, and actually the reality of owning a dog. And also then the other thing that you you mentioned was the the 
uh, splitting personalities. It's like you owning two dogs. The do two dogs. The dog in your home is this fantastic family pet. The dog in the big wide world is a totally different character, and it's and it's being overwhelmed by the whole contrast between the two um, uh, totally opposing. Um, characters. It's like you can't relate to this dog that you take out the front door. And I think that's something that's very common with people that have reactive dogs that maybe don't have the experience to foresee those things happening and how overwhelming that can be. Um, was that anything that you experienced? You know, how as first time dog owners, that must have been a lot for you to fathom. Yeah, because we, you know, we were reticent to take Spike out for a walk. Really? Yeah, couldn't introduce him to other dogs or people because the reaction was so over the top every time. Got him going to the park became like a well, almost, almost just a presidential outing in terms of you know keeping an eye open for for possible problems. People to think about you know as if the inference is that you've created the dog to be what it is and sometimes you know it might be that your lack of knowledge but it's not an intentional thing you didn't go out going right we're going to create a dog we want to make this dog bark at people and dogs that was never your agenda and i think sometimes that misunderstanding in a you know a greater a, a sort of in society can set, definitely add to the burden of you know you're already struggling with the the, the two characters that you're living with and then you have you know, people looking at you, like you say, with judgment, and that's a really, really, you know, it's, it's a really, um, it's, it's quite a prevalent thing, I think, in, um, when people have reactive dogs, the stigma and the judgment that they can sometimes receive, and, and hopefully that, you know, this dialogue and this conversation can get people to think about it and have a bit more understanding and compassion. So you obviously um, needed help. You realised that you need help. So what did you first um, do then? What did you, what, what course of action did you take? Um, we went to puppy school. We went to our first on our first puppy course, and Spike was disruptive and reactive. Mm -hmm. And um, we were asked to leave <laughs> because he was, you know, was causing problems for everyone else. Mm -hmm. That was understandable. I, mean, I, I dropped Patricia off at this puppy school, which was in a church hall. Mm -hmm. Get myself a coffee. Come back and find them standing outside because they'd been ejected. Wow. And then the course was pretty much the same. We spent the whole course outside the, the door, the classroom door, um, just, you know, trying to get Spike used to being close to other dogs from the other side of the door. I mean, we even one-on-one -on -one with the puppy class, the person who was holding the puppy classes, and we walked in the park. I'm just going to... Pause. Um, just bear with me, everybody, on Facebook, and that I think for some reason the um, the video is jumping. So I'm just going to start playing it again. It should, um, hopefully, this is not quite sure what that is. Just bear with me one second. I'm going to share my screen again. I think it's because I've got too many things open at once. So I'm going to shut some of this down and bring that up again. Just bear with me one second. All oh, whilst I just technical glitch. With her and um... course was pretty much the same. We spent the whole course outside the, the door, the classroom door. Um just you know. Okay, bear with me all. I'm just gonna try and fix this video. For some reason that video keeps juddering. So luckily <clears throat> I have it backed up. So bear with me. That accommodated that <laughs>, laughs, wags its tail. And, and loves everybody. Yeah. You know? Step that mark. And whilst you are, I always ask people to give me trust. I trust.
the person who's holding the keeping an eye open for for possible problems i'm just gonna you know, the half is just blah, 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 blah. um uh, totally opposing um characters it's like you can't relate to this dog that you take out the front door and i think that's something that's very common with people that have reactive dogs that maybe don't have the experience to foresee those things happening and how overwhelming that can be. Um, was that anything that you experienced? You know, how as first time dog owners, that must have been a lot for you to fathom. Yeah, because we, you know, we were reticent to take Spike out for a walk. Really? Yeah, couldn't introduce him to other dogs or people because the reaction was so over the top every time. Mm -hmm. Going to the park became like a Military. almost as a presidential outing in terms of you know, keeping an eye open for, for possible problems. Yeah. And you, know, it, it, you, you, do get, you do get a bit bored apologising to people as well. You know, I'm sorry, he's reactive. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, and people it, would get very upset, other dog owners would get very upset with his reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Frowny and kind of disapproving as well, as if we were doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and their their attitude but it was just very difficult for us we didn't know what to do hmm. uh, the, the thing i think that's that's a really again a really interesting point that you raised there's a lot of stigma attached that you know as if the inference is that you've created the dog to be what it is and sometimes you know it might be that your lack of knowledge but it's not an intentional thing you didn't go out going right we're going to create a dog we want to make this dog bark at people and dogs that was never your agenda and i think sometimes that misunderstanding in a you know a greater a, a sort of in society can set, definitely add to the burden of you know you're already struggling with the the, the two characters that you're living with and then you have you know people looking at you like you say with judgment and that's a really really you know it's it's a really um it's it's quite a prevalent thing i think in um when people have reactive dogs the stigma and the judgment that they can sometimes receive and, and hopefully that you know this dialogue and this conversation can get people to think about it and have a bit more understanding and compassion so you obviously um needed help you realized that you need help so what did you first um do then what did you what what course of action did you take um we went to puppy school we went to our first on our first puppy course and spike was disruptive and reactive mm -hmm. and um we were asked to leave <laughs> because he was you know was causing problems for everyone else mm -hmm. That was understandable. I, mean, I, I dropped Patricia off at this puppy school, which was in a church hall. Mm -hmm. Get myself a coffee, come back and find them standing outside because they'd been ejected. Wow. And then the course was pretty much the same. We spent the whole course outside the, the door, the classroom door, um, just you know, trying to get Spike used to being close to other dogs from the other side of the door. I mean, we even one on one with the puppy class, the person who was holding the puppy classes, and we walked in the park with with her, and 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 you know she had some useful advice, but then she also had some kind of unuseful advice. Yeah. So um, the advice really, eventually, after trying many different things with this um, trainer, mm. was um, trying medication to medicate Spike. Right. Also, to try this, the, you know, the red spray that yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, barked. Mm -hmm. It met, that made things worse, and it, we were very uncomfortable doing that. Yeah, it's like an air spray. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So on that point, I think that's something that is very commonly experienced as first-time dog owners or inexperienced dog owners with this inverted commas problem dog. You would trust your dog and the, the care and the guidance around your dog's training and care to other people because you just don't know. You just don't know what's right and what's wrong. And if you went and Google dog training on in the interweb, you would see a million different versions. And as a first time dog owner, you don't know which one is going to suit you, the dog, and you feel comfortable with. And it's really a little bit of potluck. Um, and I, I think that obviously um, the advice that you you've, were given um, you hope that was with good intentions, but as you said, it probably made things probably potentially worse. Um, and I think there's so much, um, uh, there is such a responsibility to those of us in the position as professionals 
that we are entering into a very, very personal space of, you know, dog owners, their family members. And that's the thing to remind yourself that a person is, that dog is an extension of that family. And we have a duty of care and responsibility to honor that and respect that and make sure that we always um, are respectful of that dynamic and, and not to overstep that mark. And whilst you are, I always ask people to give me trust. I trust me in this process and I, and I will do my damn just to, to help you. But it is, I have to have that dialogue with them where, because I feel really responsible for getting it right for them. Um, and I, again, I think that's something that, you know, like when you're in that position as inexperienced dog owners, you hand over the reins to somebody else and you're hoping that their judgment um, is, you know, and you're guided by them. And you're, you're sometimes, as you've, you've said, you do things that in, retros in retrospect, you wish you hadn't. But in that situation, you believe that that's the right thing to do. You trust this person. I think that's something that, you know, as an industry, we need to be really, really mindful of. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 just from our, per, you know, our point of view, we, we've been on this long learning journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mainly, we've been learning about our dog. About now, now, having known him for as long as I have, over a decade, Yeah. I kind of I understand why he's like the way, he, and 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 he has he's he's kind of got a right to be that way. Mm -hmm. And when he came to be part of our family, it was up to us to work out a way of life that accommodated that. Uh -huh. Okay, try and help him and train him and and and, and soften it or whatever. Uh, yep. Dog, he's a sensitive dog. If he doesn't like other dogs, he doesn't like other dogs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, up to us to actually understand that and realize that that's kind of a legitimate place for him to be. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that I say that um, is I urge people to look at it differently. Your dog doesn't have to like everything and everyone. That's absolutely fine. As you know, there's things in life that I don't like doing, and there's people that I might not feel that connection with, and, and that I apply to everybody. It doesn't make me a good or bad person, it just means that I have boundaries and limitations, and that's absolutely normal. And what we we sort of have this unwritten, we have this sort of con uh, compromise where we say to the dog, I absolutely get that you don't like dogs in general, but I would ask of you to just tolerate them for this this period or in this situation. Is that a fair exchange? And in op in um, as, as an exchange for that, I'm going to make sure that you're comfortable. I'm going to take um, uh, listen to what you're telling me. I'm going to reinforce you. I'm going to make it a positive experience, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to be respectful of not overfacing you. And by having that almost um, uh, sort of dialogue with the dog in terms of your training and your your the way you live your life you can live a life with a dog that is both fair to the dog and also fair to you guys because it must have been a very stressful period where you you didn't know how to resolve um a lot of his issues yeah i mean yeah, it's it, quite it, lonely and um stressing because yeah. we know with what you to know do. It's, that, it's that standard thing you think you it's your fault mm -hmm. and around it kind of telling you all the time that it's your fault you know that that, that um that somehow you should have a a kind of pretty dopey labrador type dog yeah. who laughs wags its tail and and, and loves everybody yeah. you, know? Yeah. That, you know those dogs exist yeah. and but spike wasn't one of them absolutely absolutely so how did you um how did you actually come to um to to because I, I i said to you when we had this the pre-conversation i don't actually know how you actually found me because you obviously you know um had negative experience with the training route what kept what made you go okay we need to find somebody that possibly could help us and how did that come about patricia had this kind of crusade she was going to you know, if you like, get to the bottom of it, yeah. find it. And we did um, social walks, yeah. for me. Yeah. we did a whole, and then she started to get into sort of a little bit of, 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 of fun obedience, um, just, just one night a week. And I think from that, that built the, um, the kind of the base of people that we could speak to. Right. There is this kind of network out there mm -hmm. of, of you know people like you, caring people mm -hmm. who want to connect things up. And if if, if it's not a, a kind of problem that they could deal with, 
they've got advice about who might be able to do it. That, that, that's my recollection. That we, we, we kind of organically migrated towards you okay. through other people that we knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead, Patricia, you were going to say something earlier? No, I just I kept hearing your name popping up um, where I went, you know, as the person <clears throat> that would be right to help us with Spike. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, eventually I just thought, okay, we've got to go and tra track down this command. And she wanted to do with him and he me guys, I believe said, well, audio is I'm gone. sure I can give you some input and I'm sure that I could help you and um in, in truth I know now I look back and we joke about it I went in Okay, just bear with me all. I'm just going to replay it and hopefully the audio, I'm not quite sure why that is. Technology can sometimes be a great thing, but it can be very frustrating at times. So just bear with me. I apologise, everybody. Again, this will be recorded so um, and it will be played back and I'll edit all this all out. So don't panic if you are trying to keep up with things. Um, it will all be replayed afterwards. So hopefully I'm, I'm coming back out now. If somebody could just um, let me know. Uh, so do, 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 do. hopefully I'm uh, okay now. So excellent. So Lou, let me just make sure that Lou, I'm just going to bring Lou on the camera quickly. Lou, could you just unmute yourself and just make sure that I'm coming out and everybody can hear me and then I will start playing the video again. Yeah, I've got you on Zoom and I've got you on Facebook. Excellent. Brilliant. All right. I'm going to um, share my screen again and we're going to continue with the video again. I apologize, everybody, for the little glitches when you're live streaming there. It's always that possibility. So I apologize and hopefully we're going to um, just stick with us and um, a lot of great information coming out from Patricia and her conversation. So I'm going to replay. I'm going to share my screen and continue with the video. random bike or something to get to a place that she post the lesson I said to our very good friend um, Val I said I don't think that girl got any of what I said <laughs> and I, I think I don't think she'll come back so and it was really because I was and I look back and we talk about it, it was, there was so much information I was giving you in a you know in that lesson in that time period about right we're going to have to take a different route we're going to have to do this and looking at everything holistically and I have to say full credit to you I gave Patricia a, very, a couple of little core things to work on. And I said, go away and do this. Contact me if you want to come back for another lesson. And I can remember the subsequent lesson. And I went afterwards and said to Val, 
oh my God, I read that girl wrong. She absolutely nailed every single thing that I advised her to do. And that was a real like, oh, okay, right. She's not here to play. She wants to really commit. And that's what I ask of everybody to really commit to the process. And it really just snowballed from there. And that the, the you know, I Patricia worked incredibly hard and, and full credit to Patricia and Ian for being all in to this process and really committing. Um, and as we were working together, a lot more come out of the wash like you know in that initial lesson obviously Patricia was on her own it was a one-to-one -one. I didn't see his response and his issues with other dogs and while she told me a little bit in that it was in that first lesson there was no way I was going to expose the dog to another dog to test him and to see what the issue was so as it came out the wash I realized that actually whilst we could teach this dog core skills there was more work around um his core issues that needed to be addressed um, how, how did, can you remember that lesson, how you felt about it post, Patricia? So, were you depressed? Did you go back and drink a lot? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of information. Yeah, yeah. Transmitting a lot of information, new information. Um, yeah, lots of light bulb moments. Things I had never heard before. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah, that... Sorry. I felt really afterwards because you willing to take us on board and you also your attitude you know you didn't see it as a problem mm -hmm. or it as a challenge that that's a really really fair point because that's the thing that my intention for this course is always being to change people's perceptions of their own dogs your dog is not a problem you just need to give the dog some information we need to up your skill and give you some skills and we're going to move forward this is not this is just this is not the um this is not a permanent situation that's the big the why the course is called relabeling reactivity because i want people to look at their own dogs differently when people are coming to you and essentially saying almost writing their dog off before their dog has even have a chance that that's the thing that i want to change people's mentality up towards so you know it it really just went each um we just went from strength to strength but in terms of the process can you share with people a little bit about, you know, it wasn't just a linear state of progression, wasn't it? There was moments, I'm sure. Um, would you be willing to share with us some of the ups and downs that you had? And did you ever question what you were doing and whether it would work, etc.? Yes, yeah. Um, it, was, it was all new and fresh stuff to us. We, you know, it was a lot of new information that we needed to absorb. Mm -hmm. And um, I just couldn't see a way out of it because we had tried so many different things that hadn't worked. So, um, I mean, there were there's so many ups and downs. We, it was just you, your faith and belief in us kept, kept us going, I think. I mean, the, the, the advantage that we've had is that you know patricia's incredibly tenacious yeah 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 definitely and you know we really deeply love spike mm -hmm. um and and the reason that of that being that he is very very lovable yeah um, and he gives it back yeah so there's always been a reason to keep moving forward mm -hmm. But well, effectively you know we we got to a stage where you know we might ma we managed the situation you know, I, he, we we do a lot of walking at night when everybody else was, you know, back back in at home. Um, you know, we go to the park at times when we, you know, when we knew it'd be quiet, and we go to particular areas of of the park that we knew would be quiet. Uh, and so we built in to our life with Spy all these, if you like, um, strategies, yeah, protocols, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, you know. Patricia was moving forward with yourself um, to, to to find ways of, of, of you know improving on those strategies to make it with him yeah. into training yeah. rather than find it all to the, the the wider world. That's what the, my intention is. We're not going to focus on other people or the wider world. We're going to focus on the dog. We're going to establish confidence. We're going to we're going to build his confidence and your confidence and give him skills and you skills. So the the wider world becomes obsolete because I think that's a very common thing that you, people try and work concentrate on. But how do I deal with that dog? How do I deal with that person? You can't. 
that's beyond your remit of control. What you can control is your dog. You can control your response. You can control your reaction and therefore affect the dog's reaction. Um, and as I said, you know, um, the, 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 the journey that you went on was, you know, is so inspiring. And that's why I really wanted to have this conversation with you. So from an outsider looking in, I have to say the two things that Ian just mentioned, Patricia's tenacity and the, the absolutely, um, unbounding love that she had for the dog I think was the the things that really really you know made this whole thing work and I would say that's a common thread with a lot of people they want to help their dogs they might not know how to but they want to help their dogs and they absolutely adore their dogs they and that's the thing that uh, it frustrates me when people are attaching these labels to it would be like somebody saying the same about my daughter I would instantly bristle and, and have a reaction to so obviously it just went from strength to strength, you know, and, and progressed. Share with people. So um, obviously I, I broached the subject with you about doing competitive obedience and doing it like, you know, I think that you could do quite well. Um, and because he's an unusual breed, he's not of a breed that is that's popular in a competitive obedience. Um, that was a factor that we had to consider. And obviously his temperament and um, his uh, awareness about other dogs. So those of you that are watching that don't know, in competitive obedience, there's a lot of dogs at a dog show. You could talk several hundreds of dog shows and there'll be several hundred people. Um, and that's the things that we had to prepare the dog for. And he had to be so confident, so robust, so well-trained that he could cope in those environments. Um, and that was part of his uh, pr the process that we went through with Patricia. Now, that isn't the process for necessarily for all of you, but the means of which we did that will most definitely help other people um so can you remember where, your first experience of going to a dog show and how it felt did you feel overwhelmed or were you excited or how did that go for you um excited and overwhelmed um you know you told us exactly what to do we had to take it slowly mm -hmm. and we just had lots of um nice rewards with us mm -hmm. so that we could try and keep spike active focused on us rather than on all the other dogs yeah. uh, strangely enough come on i mean and, and it, it, it might it might be sort of a, a little bit of information that helps you understand a bit about spine mm -hmm. and the fact that he he, he like take, when he was at crufts he can handle 200 dogs he just can't have one dog but i think that was because of monday nighters because but, i remember yeah, yeah. yeah used to be a massive challenge mm -hmm. yeah but, and uh, monday night has met him it was fantastic to be in that environment with the energy and the noise and the dogs yeah yeah controlling it all you know so the good experience for the dogs yeah, yeah. But, but, sorry sorry patricia i just got your car out there a little bit um i just what was the final point you just made on that just the, the monday night is your monday experience led us to being able to eventually mm -hmm. go and perform at Crufts yeah. it's like perform at Crufts in front of hundreds of people and hundreds of dogs I mean I've got video of, of where Patricia and Spike are in the ring mm -hmm. and they could be alone and it, you know there's this massive audience around them in the stand clapping and you yeah. would stuff like that and Spike is not is it they're in their own little um, bubble yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can remember that vividly. So, just on, so Monday nighters was a, a a class that I used to um, run in London when I lived in London, and it was a competitive class where it was a great bunch of people. And there's other people that are, are going to speak on on that shortly. Um, but it was a fundamental piece of the puzzle that it was saying to Patricia, "Look, you can have your dog around other dogs." everybody's going to be supportive of you they're all going to say look we'll give you space we'll back away i specifically said to everybody i can remember and i do this with every dog that comes into my, that situation is patricia has a dog that doesn't like other dogs in his space if your dog invades patricia's dog space that is on your shoulders not patricia's because patricia's going to manage her dog that alleviates the responsibility from the individual and it means that everybody's accountable for their own dog as we they should be now in that situation obviously they were people that were um that were there to train their dog so they had a, an element of control but it meant that patricia could then 
stay in her little zone, focus on her dog. She didn't have to worry about so-and-so's dog and so and, and dogs are dogs. There was moments where a dog would inadvertently rush up to um, to Spike and in and but we would have prepared him, we would have trained him, and we would have done lots of work to lead up to that point. Often we would give him, we would, you know, put him in a corner where he was a bit more felt safer. We would make sure that nobody went so after a certain point, which is things that professionals can do to help these dogs as opposed to making them like the you know um have a you know a scarlet letter on there and shrouding them in a sense of shame so as patricia and ian mentioned it just the the, the confidence and that the, what they were able to do just grew and grew and grew and the ultimate uh, sort of achievement that they um that they had amongst many was going to cross and competing for their region which is a very highly contested um uh position so it's what happens in crafts you have several competitions one of them is an um, an inter area so um you would have the south east you'd have the midlands you'd have and it's a very cont highly contested and it's specifically unique because they have the majority of the members of the team are from other breeds of dogs so um, you have to go to tryouts, you have to go to several tryouts, you have to um, then compete against your peers to get a position and there's a very limited position. So to even go through that rigorous process to become a member of the team for the south of England and then Patricia represented not only her area but she actually won her respective um, uh, class at Crafts which was whilst that was a great you know it was a huge um, um, recognition of her hard work Ian just summarised the actual win in that that dog went out onto that. It could make me quite emotional thinking about it, really. You know, I like he went out on that thing, and I can remember watching him from the sidelines. And there was nobody else that existed in that dog's world, bar Patricia, and there was nobody else. For, there was nothing in Patricia's world, bar Spark, Spark at that moment. And I can I can remember. Oh God, I don't. I'm getting bloody. It's COVID. I'm going to blame it on COVID. But I can remember seeing it and thinking, that's what we've worked for all yeah. the years for that singular moment where there was there was this this perfect union of and i thought that's why i do what i do that's my job because it isn't about it was brilliant that other people saw it and they recognized it and you got the recognition in terms of the red rosé but it, that was neither here nor there because in that moment you had overcome so many obstacles um to to achieve that little singular moment and you know moving forward from that the relationship that you have with him now is just i mean like he's changed i mean i've you can certainly interject he's changed your life in so many ways that dog isn't he really you know yeah. you know <laughs> oh, it's fantastic he has friends now that he can go and run with yeah yeah with walking with loose dogs or vals yeah yeah and he's, sorry, go on. He's happy, he's content. Yeah, yeah. Take him anywhere on any form of transport. He can yeah. sit in eating with me. Yeah. Well, he's driven all over, we've driven all over Europe with him, you know. And he, 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 he handles hotels, he handles everything. He handles film shoots. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. And, and it, I think, you know, the, the, as we've peeled back, the layers of what was ailing him, what was you know creating this this kind of inner panic that 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 that, that was the the core of his reactivity. Um, it's funny because one of the first things that Patricia did at Crofts was the obedience yep. uh, competition, which is where they you know to, it was the kennel club wanting to um, get the breed into obedience and she got into the the, the schnauzer team and he, he didn't have a problem with schnauzers you know he, 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 yeah, but that was after months and years of monday nighters yeah no exactly yeah. that's what i'm saying they, they yeah. started off oh well yeah schnauzers are okay maybe other dogs are not so bad as well and and it built up gradually from from yeah. Riders to working with a whole team of dogs, yeah. and and then then just being in in Crofts or Bcos mm -hmm. or the Nationals yeah. with a you know a, a, an aircraft hangar full of dogs all voicing, but they're all dogs whose owners are responsible, and they don't allow it. It's not like going to the park where you get somebody with a with a Jack Russell mm -hmm. off lead that, that thinks 
the dog should have the right to run up to any other dog and jump into its face. Yeah, but then in saying that, the thing to say is, obviously, even at those events at dog shows, you're going to have instances where there's a there's a whole um, you know melee of dogs, and that at one point when you started this whole process, I suspect it wasn't you thought there's no way our dogs ever going to be in a you know in a space with several hundreds of dogs. If I had said to you when you first come to that lesson, oh, by the way, Patricia, do you realise one day your dog's going to be in a building with several hundreds of dogs and he's going to be oblivious to them all? You would have probably laughed in my face and thought I was a madman and just doubled back and gone, right, we found the wrong person. Oh, still- <laughs> <laughs> but what I, so it just shows you what is possible. And yes, in and obviously in competition, dogs are somewhat more controlled, but it's just say, the, the thing to articulate is, that dog didn't see anybody else. It wouldn't have mattered if the Jack Russell had come and sniffed him where he was so in the zone, he was so focused, and we'd done so much foundation work with him and groundwork to consolidate your relationship. It's and like you say, that even the fact that you can take him anywhere, you can go on public transport, you can, you know, walk past dogs, he's largely in, he's indifferent. Now, you know. It's accepting. He might not be have a wide social circle of friends. He has his little buddies, but he goes largely. I'm not really interested in other people's dogs. That's fantastic. That's the win, isn't it? Really, where he goes. Well, I'm not really. I'd rather not have anything to do with that dog over there. But that one's fine. That's that's the win, isn't it? Really, you know. And and the impact he's had, and the dog that he's now is, and more importantly, the fact that you don't have that um. Uh, that pressure and that, um, you know, it's it's so ironic that people would now look at him and think, oh, God, I want a dog that behaves like Spike. You know, that's the irony, isn't it, really? Like, yeah. he, he's the poster yeah. child now for a well-behaved dog. Well-behaved, well-behaved he is. Yeah. 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 Now, listen, it's been fantastic talking to you. I really appreciate... This went on longer than what I thought it would be, but I really appreciate you... Your oh. friend, Real because yeah. you know, it, it is such an interesting story in in, the, in in a very real story. The fact that you know you go, it's like you go to the shops, you buy something, and you're going to live with that with that thing for for ten years or so. Yeah. Um, and you can't take it back to the shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can't, I don't want to play this anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're all in. It's, it's, like, it's, sorry, go it's like a relationship. They, Absolutely. They, yeah absolutely listen guys it's been fantastic thank you very much for your time Uh, and and uh, allow me to be part of spike's journey i wish you nothing but the best he's most definitely one of the most you know he has a special place for me certainly as a a professional dog trainer and uh, you know i've met you now i you know have you to his friends as a result of it so it's definitely been a life altering experience i wish you nothing but So hopefully I'm coming back out on Zoom now um, and we're going on Facebook. Um, I wanted um, to share Patricia's story for as you know, I'm just reading some of the comments and everybody has really picked up on um, how genuine and heartfelt her story and her um, the experience was. And I wanted to share that as, as some of you mentioned to give you people hope and inspiration of what is possible. And for those that have um, that saw Patricia or know of her, will bear witness to the fact of um, how amazing they um uh, the, what they achieved was and and the relationship they have together so um i recognize this oh excuse me there is a question i absolutely get there's going to be questions so if we're going to hang on for those to the end because i want to um keep the um, the evening flying let me just first for apologize to those watching if there is the connection problem the internet is a a, a a a temperamental beast um so bear with me whilst we work through those technological um, issues i hopefully this is um going to flow now for the rest of the evening so i'm going to um ask one of my students um again and friends um to come on and talk about his experience he was one of um uh, his name is dylan he has a dog called amos who was also one of the um Monday nighters and he was a again a very similar story to Patricia a first time dog owner um, that got a border terrier um, and all that flowed and followed from um, his experience and and I just want to just speak to him and invite him into this conversation um, for you guys to listen to some of his experiences and hopefully um, it may resonate with you so I'm going to add Dylan the spotlight 
Dylan, ah, there we go. Okay. So thank you. Good evening, Dylan. Thank you for uh, joining. Um, so well, 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 I'm loving the hair, Dylan. I did it especially for you, Kamal. <laughs> so I, I'm going to jump straight in I, um, to the reason why you're here. Obviously, Dylan's helped me massively with um, this project um, as a sounding board for ideas. And as a person that had a, a, a reactive dog or a dog that was deemed reactive, um, that's how we first met. And um, he's been instrumental in guiding the content of this course. And he's gave me some fantastic feedback about what someone in his position as a first time dog owner would want to see and experience within a course if he could have his time again. So Dylan, just um, tell people a little bit about Amos and obviously his, what, how you came to, we came to be and, and obviously um, uh, as a, a dog, uh, as a dog owner, how that went for you then. Sure. Um, Amos was my first dog, um, as you said. Um, I'd always, I'd grown up in a family who had owned cats and always wanted a dog, but waited because of work reasons until I was sort of settled at work and everything like that. Um, ended up with a Border Terrier because I'd seen them around. I liked the look of them, a bit like Patricia. It sort of fitted with my London lifestyle and things like that. Not a huge amount of thought about what it would be like having a Border Terrier in the city, but, um, you know, it was, anyway, I, I ended up with Amos um, and he was, he was quite different to Patricia's experience in that Amos was what I would, you might call overconfident. You know, he was a type of highly wired, um, very, very excitable, rush up to dogs in the park and jump on them as his first reaction and things like that. You know, so that was my sort of introduction to dog ownership. Um, and it was hard work, you know, I, we didn't know, really know how to handle it. Um, so we went to training schools and things like that, which were great, but they sort of slightly ignored the core problem really, or we felt that they did. And we, we never really understood the best way to handle um, this dog who would scream his head off in excited situations, you know, taking him to puppy class the first time was just, I'd never seen anything like it, you know. He just turned into a whirling dervish. He wanted to get to everything. He wanted to get into everything. He was so vocal about it. So yeah, he was he was a handful. Um, he was he was very responsive to training and things like this. And but yeah, um, so it sort of built towards him gradually. That so through various sort of mishandling or sort of getting things wrong or work, you know, not again not knowing what we're doing really. Um, he ended up sort of developing this slightly reactive tendencies and things got worse. Um, we tried a few different trainers and we tried different approaches, but again, nothing seemed to sort of um, be helping us out really. Yeah. So then I, I got recommended by somebody to come and see you. And um, I think the first time you saw Amos would have been, we met up and did a... Um, a lesson didn't we yeah yeah we did a lesson but you got him out with your dogs yeah. um and of course <laughs> in that instance i think come on, um amos was brilliant you yeah. know he was aware of the dogs but you didn't see any problems as in he didn't you know he didn't kick off or anything like that and that was quite typical of amos you know he could be absolutely fine but then a dog pulling towards him or anything like that would really trigger him and he would just go into hyperdrive so yeah and um, I think so a lot of what you and Patricia have shared are very common themes with people that have um, uh, reactive dogs. So that Jekyll and Hyde personality, the one dog that you have in certain situations and the dog that you have in um, other situations are totally alien. The two things are like, as if you've got two independent dogs, identical twins, one's the, the nice twin and one's the problematic twin. And it's knowing how to deal with that. And as uh, the, the frustration sometimes could be with that you know, people love their dogs and they care deeply and they want their dogs to be shown in the best light. But often they're, because they're not, mis they're, the dogs are misunderstood. There's that stigma again. And there's that, you know, how do I sort this problem out? And often there's a, um, 
it's not I suppose there's a lack of understanding of that like you say the core root of the problem with he was actually he was frightened by the situation he would get worried and rather than going trying to deal with him lunging and barking let's build his confidence up let's get him so that he's in a you know a happier more buoyant dog around other dogs and so forth yeah yeah, yeah absolutely I, I think a big big problem is the in the park or everywhere there's 101 opinions about what you should do you know yeah. and i think you touched upon this with patricia there's everybody will say oh i wouldn't stand for that and we would do this and go to this trainer because he'll really sort that out and yeah. you sort of struggling with the dog you'll be sort of like oh yeah that'd be amazing and you run off and try something and yeah so it's it's tough but yeah um it's it can be hard work, especially for first timers. You know, I think that's, yeah. that's that's a big point. You know, I've got quite you know my other dog Edie's quite a handful as well, but in a different way. But I've learned so much from Amos that you know I'm I feel well she's not anything like as reactive. She still has her moments that are interesting, but it's a different way of with the experience of Amos handling a second dog's much better. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it the. Obviously, there's, you know, you've done an amazing job with Amos and, and, you know, creating his focus. And Dylan came to my, originally my pet training class, and then he yep. got hooked into the prospect of training um, more for competitive obedience. And it's now largely immersed his his whole world in that he's got a second dog who is now training with that intention of doing dog sports. Amos went to obedience shows and he competed really successfully. Um, at, you know, he did amazingly well. You know, he's a border terrier. He's an unconventional breed of dog. He's not what you would normally see in obedience circles. And yet he did amazingly, amazingly well. Um, but greater than that, he went from being the problem child um, to now, like, you know, we joke about um, Dylan's partner, like almost using it to show off to her, to her friends about yeah, how well, she's just sitting over there. Is she? Oh, okay. We love Linda. She's the best. <laughs> we know she really trained uh, Amos, but it was at one point, it's that dynamic. And it, it's that, I think that it's understanding that when the dog is problematic, it can actually really create uh, that issue. It can, res it can sort of have a ripple effect to other areas, can't it? You know, it really becomes like, oh, it's the problem dog, etc. And I think that's what, again, professionals need to be aware of about helping them and be compassionate towards people when they're in that situation. So from a dog owner point of view, what would you say were the things that, um, you know, look that we did with him that were really, really impactful that changed the way in which the dog behaved? And what was the key things that you would say and share with people? I think the, the main thing was coming to a class that wasn't stressing about it or wasn't telling us what he was doing wrong or that he shouldn't be doing this and things like that. I think, I, I you know, the, the pet dog class was had a variety of breeds and all that sort of thing so there was you know potential for him to kick off at certain dogs and he would have his moments but you would help me sort of say it's fine you know it's just it's a bit too close to so give him some more space or all those sorts of things and fairly quickly Amos I mean the, the focus of doing the training in that environment helped and so it gave him something to do so it got his focus on me and all that sort of stuff um that really helped and I think it was just exposure and sort of repeated exposure and and gaining the confidence of how to deal with it, that it wasn't a crisis, that yeah. it wasn't necessarily going to keep getting worse and worse yeah. and worse, which is yeah. part of what it felt like. You know, um, it was OK, it's not it's not perfect, but we can work on it and it will get better. I think that was one of the big things is this sort of sense that it was going to get better. And then, you know, so moving on to the Monday nighters walking in with um shepherds and rotties, rotties and mari's um yep. giant schnauzers and all that lot you know i would have walked in well i think we probably did walk in and he probably kicked off a couple of times but over a period of not that long he got so much better and mm -hmm. you know i wouldn't have believed that before so i think that's a really really um valid point that you you make in that you know my my what i offer to people and suggest is don't just hide away from from dealing with those problems and let's you know build that layers of confidence so that your dog can cope in those situations which you may previously have perceived as um com uh, challenging the mm. key things that i think that we really worked on with you was giving you the skills and giving you the confidence and giving you core behaviors that you could fall on and utilize so for example focus was a massive thing like getting him very focused on you teaching really, really good understanding of sit down recall cues so that you could fall back on those. Often when you have a dog that's reactive or deep problem, 
behavior that's deemed reactive. There's that sense of being out of control, which then makes you feel vulnerable and then creates that anxiety within you, which can then escalate and make the problem seem a hundred times worse than it probably really is. But that that feeling is valid in that moment because you're feeling deeply overwhelmed by the situation. How I perceive reactivity and overcoming it is equipping the handler, owner, guardian with the skills of which they can navigate situations which they normally would be overwhelmed by, both by also giving them dog training skills, but also giving them skills for themselves that they can work on to build their confidence. I would say one of the things that I worked on with certainly Patricia and Dylan was giving them confidence, like you can do it, it'll be fine, we'll manage the situation, giving them that feedback to say, you know, and equipping them with skills um, in the mental skills almost and like um, to be able to say, okay, in this situation, let's slow things down, stop rushing, create distance, take your time, you know, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you really can't just remove yourself, just take the dog on a scenic route, take the long route, take an alternative path. Um, and therefore, you know, avoid the situation rather than trying to go head on with it. But then in the same vein, OK, let's come back and revisit that. Let's set you up for success. Let's break it down. Um, and that's the approach that I feel is really, really effective with getting people to to move their dogs forward and creating confidence with them. Um, yeah, great points, Dylan. I mean, really, really appreciate you. I think, you know, I, think it, it, I mean, it was no, having having something to do or, or learning what you could do in that situation yeah. meant that you can handle it with confidence or more confidence than I don't know what to do. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. And giving giving the handler, the owner, the skills. Um, I'm just reading some of the comments about um, some of the things that make it really, really great. Um, you know, the, the, the comments here, I'm just glancing over on my phone, so I'm not just disconnecting with Dylan. But it's it's how the 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 comments that Dylan and, and Patricia have made have really resonated with hit the note and a nerve with people in that this isn't just you know, Dylan's not unique in his experience. Patricia wasn't unique in her experience. You know, this is something that a lot of people feel and it's giving them, that's what the intention of relabeling reactivity is to give people the tools of which they can help their dogs and therefore help themselves and help the dogs. That, this, this has been a massive um, project, a real passion project, I should say. And, and actually I bounced this idea off Dylan when it first was something I was thinking about. I, I felt like there was definitely a lack of knowledge and lack of understanding about how to effectively help people with their dogs. And not just, you know, like by managing them constantly where, you know, you have to have these management protocols. And there is absolutely a time and place for management. I'm not belittling management. There's always going to be a place for management. But what we want to try and do is min manage the an absolute minimum we have to so that we can live this full life where we can take our dog to the public park, where we can take them you know as a family member when we go away on trips abroad or you know um you know on a holiday let or whatever and we see other dogs or we take them to the beach and we live that fantastic life and that's what i want for everybody um that is in watching this at home and um is considering joining this course dylan i appreciate it thank you very much no, um you. fantastic um input and, and again thank you for all your help with being part of this process so i'm just gonna go back so i'm gonna remove the spotlight so again thank you there's some great comments i'm going to come back to questions so bear with me everybody and we're going to introduce you to one of the um contributors on the course um and it will be a very good friend of mine um most of you would have probably met her when in various things that i've done on social media she's a really great friend of mine but most of you may or may not be aware that her actual background or her, her one of the massive parts of um, her this individual her name is lou holmes is that she has a huge um, amount of experience and expertise in nose work. She is a, um, a search and rescue um, trainer. She has trained hearing dogs for the deaf. She's done a, a loads of different things, police dogs. She's trained police dog puppies. She's done a load of work in nose work. And the reason I asked Lou to be part of this project is because I felt there was a missing entity with, once these dogs have um, some skills and core skills that I can help them with, and we're building their confidence. We need a vocation for these dogs so that they don't revert back to being problematic. The obvious choice for most people is to do something like nose work. Nose work is something that you can do largely on your own. You don't need a massive amount of equipment. You don't need a massive amount of resources. You can largely do it anywhere. You can start it in your living room. So it's really, really practical for most people to do um, with any type of dog, any breed of dog, any age of dog, any size of dog you can do. A lot of the other sports and I, you know, I partake in a lot of sports with my dogs. 
Um, there is a specific equipment involved, you need specific facilities, you need a certain, you know, um, there's certain restrictions and pros and cons, etc. Nose work is something that anybody can do. Lou was most definitely the um, obvious choice. She's a, as I said, she's had five, five search and rescue dogs that are qualified and have been out there doing it and literally saving people's lives. Um, and I wanted you guys to meet her and, and just have this dialogue. The other thing that's specific about Lou is that she had a dog called Chip, who I talked about in one of my blogs written about reactivity, who, again, I'm going to let her share a little bit of insight into him and introduce herself and what she's contributed to the course. So bear with me whilst I get Lou on the call. Hopefully she's here. Where are you, Lou? There you are. So let's put you on the spotlight. OK. Hey, Lou. So Hi. Hi, everybody. Hopefully everybody can see Lou. Uh, I'm just going to make sure before we get into a bit of a chat that it's coming out on Facebook. So hopefully it's all good. I mean, there's a slight delay, but I think we're good. So welcome, Lou. Uh, one of my closest friends. Um, my daughter adores Lou. Um, I have to say it's a sideline <laughs> thing. Um, so I obviously asked Lou to be involved in this project because of her ex expertise. Lou, could you just share with people a little bit about your background and um, what you've done in terms of nose work and your role um, at present? Yep, sure. So, um, so I grew up um, in Lancashire um, in a very lovely um, sort of town. My parents' neighbours, uh, the gentleman who lived next door to my parents, was very involved in mountain rescue with his dogs. Uh, and um, he had uh, four border collies um, and they were all sort of operational search dogs. And I used to get up every morning to go out for a walk with him with, with his dogs because I wasn't allowed my own dog. Um, so I used to set my alarm and go out for a walk with him with his dogs and then go off to school uh, and uh, every weekend and evenings and things I'd badger him to take me along to the uh, to the search dog training and let me hide up on the hillsides and things and I I was deeply like fascinated by what the dogs could do how far away they could find how they did that how they trained them to do that uh, and then I think on a on a more human and personal level really resonated with me is that one of my very earliest memories was that he um he spent Christmas away from home with his dogs because um when there was the Lockbit air crash and um, he went away with his search dogs and was involved in um in looking uh for people and um unfortunately remains of people up there uh, and I think from a very early age then, um, that ages me a little bit, but um, from an early age then, he... Um, Lou, you're that, bigger. Oh, that's it. Good. Yeah. Um, I was really sort of, um, you know, keen on doing nose work and things with dogs, exploring what they could do. Uh, when I left school, I went to, to actually work with horses. Uh, and then when I finished working with horses, um, I went to work at hearing dogs for deaf people, so training assistance dogs um, over there and working uh, with the dogs and the people, um, the deaf recipients of the dogs. Uh, whilst I was there, um, hearing dogs were approached to, um, to form a group that uh, um, is now um, a charity in its own existence, but we were involved, a group of us and my first dog, uh, my dog that I had at the time there, um, in looking where the dogs could detect cancer um, in, uh, your, from urine samples um, and um, doing a, a sort of pilot study on whether that was possible, um, which again was, um, was something that I was very heavily involved in and coincided with that we, um, we set up a team uh, in the Thames Valley area for search dogs, which was a new thing for lowland areas obviously mountain rescue dogs have been around forever um but lowland rescue um certainly didn't have dogs involved at the time and brock was the first qualified um dog for for lowland rescue um and since then um and now my fifth dog is now in in training for um for search and rescue work uh 
and um, yeah as you say I've done um police dog puppy walking and things I've worked with the police doing some picker training and things with them and tracking work and scent work nose work thing teaching dogs um de uh, drugs detection and things through clicker training rather than some of the um the more traditional methods that they used to use um and and now have my own business um working with dogs uh pet tra training uh training people um for different things uh as well as still being a very active member and uh, assessor with my search and rescue team amazing so again vastly experienced in the realms of nose work and you can see that that's why Lou was such an obvious choice for somebody not only is she a really close friend but she her her expertise in this area was something that I felt would be a great as, uh, uh, input and a part of this course so Lou specifically I asked and this is why uh, one of the other contributing factors of why I asked Lou to join this project was um, she had a dog I talked about, Chip. Chip was a crossbreed who had the potential. He had a very traumatic experience at a very young age. I go if you go to my blog, um, uh, um, it's not a, a crack, it's a chip, um, where I talk about Lou specifically. I'm going to let Shoot Lou just give us a little bit of insight into that story and what happened with Chip. And then we're going to talk about what she's contributed to the course. So, Lou, do you just want to talk about, um, obviously, I gave a little bit of lead in there with um, Chip. So just tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, sure. So um, so Chip was a dog that I got uh, as a puppy. He was actually a repeat mating of um, my first search dog, Brock, uh, who I was desperately keen to have a repeat of because, you know, he was the best dog in the world. Um, and um, uh, and you couldn't have asked for chalk and cheese more if you'd if you'd done it. But um, but uh, he did. Chip ha did have a um, his reactivity was caused by uh, was definitely caused by trauma. In that when he was about ten weeks old, I took him to the park uh, with the other dogs that I had with me at the time, uh, and we were in the park and a dog um, uh, came running across the park and pinned him to the floor and pretty much took half of his face off and he was very lucky to sort of survive it and um and not actually need more doing than he did but um lots and lots and lots and lots of stitches later uh obviously he was understandably um very upset by what had happened uh, and very traumatized by it obviously then consequently very reactive to other dogs and um, I think that there was a lot, obviously, as you can imagine, in that situation, a lot of like screaming and yelling. And so that made him actually quite fearful about people and things as well. Um, that he just sort of related the whole thing to to that. Um, and so, yeah, he was uh, he was not in a good place when uh, he recovered physically from that. Uh, but mentally, obviously, that took an, an awful lot longer. Uh, and I genuinely and wholeheartedly believe that had he not had a job to do, had we not been able to sort of channel uh, his abilities into something that he could do, he probably would have ended up having to be put to sleep. I'm almost certain he would have bitten somebody. Um, uh, just, just purely through fear and things and just uh, um explain the phenomenon of what would happen when he put his uniform slash jacket on when he was in that mode of doing something no yeah so he was always um so just as a general sort of pet dog you i always was obviously on it got much better i worked with it and, and it did get better but i was always on the watch out on walks uh and actually he was he was fine if you set off with the dog and we got him built his confidence and things but if you met a dog suddenly coming around the corner that that terrified him and his and his way of dealing with that was to actually go in himself um but such was his um his love and his sort of just became this completely different persona when you put a uh, a jacket on it it was almost like you know Clark Kent becoming Superman that he put his little cape on and he was unrecognizable as the same dog you could literally go through throngs of people throngs of dogs dogs could come up to him and he wouldn't even see them it was like they were not there mm -hmm. uh, and like this just this amazing transformation mm -hmm. uh, and then when you took the cape back off again mm -hmm. and he wasn't 
sort of on his job, then he was back to sort of, oh, okay, well, I've got to look out for this and I've got to look out for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then what over time, what happened? That that working mentality bled into his domestics and he get, ended up being like, I mean, he was the sweetest dog in the end, wasn't he? He was like the dog that you'd use for stooge dogs. He was yeah. amazing, wasn't it? Because of that, that using that, that um, negative energy and turning it. And the big thing that I'd say was really Lou's forte was she didn't see the dog as a victim. She saw the dog as, okay, this has happened. How are we going to move it? And I think that's Lou's strength as a trainer. She doesn't see the dog as, oh, poor um, um, Chip. Oh, he, you know, he's had this atrocious thing. I must protect him for the world. She sort of went, okay, it's happened. Let's move forward. And that's something that I would urge everybody to take a leaf out of Lou's, Lou's book. Again, she's, um, I write about her specifically in um, the blog, if you want to go and look to that. Anybody that, um, signs up for the relabeling reactivity course there is will be an ebook in which I um, cover part of that will be some of the blogs and there's a stack of information in that ebook the ebook is also going to be available separately to the course so if you um, can't you know um, partake in the course at this moment the ebook is going to be available that will be launched next week so the reason why I asked Lou to um, contribute one because of her experience two in terms of nose work two because she's been in the position that many of you are presently or may have been with a dog that could have a problem um and she's walked the walk and talked the talk but also the benefits as she just articulated about nose work for a dog that either lacks confidence just explain to people um why you believe that nose work is so beneficial um and just again give everybody a brief outline of what you've contributed to the course yeah sure so um all dogs use their nose it's something that every single dog uh, on this planet does um, on a on an almost daily basis um, and so we were able it's really easy to channel that into something that they uh, that they really enjoy doing uh, and to give them that outlet through then um, working their brain so it's great for dogs that are um, maybe less mobile if they've got a physical injury and things uh, as well as for dogs that that are fit as a fiddle but um you know, you maybe can't let them off in as many places as others because of because of their issues or um, reactivities and things. Um, and there's always something that you can get them to um, to look for and to channel that into. And um, I was just seeing that there was a comment on the uh, on Facebook about that they would really like to do some nose work and things with their dog, but they're worried about people. Well, that doesn't matter. You can teach a dog to find anything and we can, you know, really channel that. Um, I do um, scent work classes for my pet dog people and things. Um, and um, we have, uh, we've had dogs in the past there that have been worried about people. Um, and so, we, you know, it's not people that we get those dogs to look for. Um, and so the content that I've provided for this co- course um, for you, um, is broken down into three areas. So nose work, looking for um, uh, things um, which we start off with food uh, or with a toy, uh, and we can we can build that up to that you're uh, getting them to look for a specific scent. So it might be garlic clove, it might be um, gun oil, it could be literally anything. We've had we've done money with some dogs at um, pet dog training class. That's always popular getting them to to search out the ten pound notes. Um, uh, and then there's also a tracking section to the course content. So um, teaching the dogs to follow a track again that doesn't ne- that doesn't necessarily need to be somebody else. So that can be a track that you've laid yourself um, and the dogs following that. Uh, so if they're wary and things about people, there's not that that sort of pressure on them that they've got to deal with finding a person at the end of it. Um, and and also a man trailing section. So uh, if they're OK with um, with people or we can build them up to be in um, to be in it a lot better with people. Um, there's a man trailing uh, section to it as well. So that's following specific scent of a specific person. Um, and so the three areas that we've sort of covered in the course. Yeah, excellent. And then, as I say, I'm I'm massively um, excited about what Lou's going to bring to the table. 
mainly because of what, as I say, she's her experience and, and she's literally done this with a dog that had a major yeah. potential, major issue. So a huge, huge asset to the course. Um, so the, just to give you a brief, and I know some of you have asked questions, um, I'm going to go over that at the end of once everybody's con um, done their um, you've met each of the people that have contributed. I'm just mindful of the time. And I know um, uh, Christina, she's, she's joining us from America and she um, is on a different time zone. So uh, and we're gonna come to her shortly um, and allow her to just to guys to meet her. So thank you very much, Lou. I massively appreciate You're welcome. what you've done and I'm excited about everybody that's watching getting to know you better and glean from your knowledge. Okay, moving on. So I'm gonna introduce, so, I've talked extensively about the dog training. I've talked extensively about what, how we can um, help people gain confidence and how they can help their dogs gain confidence. But there's a huge entity that we, that I feel is really, really impactful for um, reactivity in dogs or dogs that have issues based on um, concerns, fear, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, as I talked at the beginning of this um, evening about the relationship between dog and handler. As something that's really, really unique within this course is that that has been considered and there is a whole section dedicated to um, self-care and well-being within um, uh, dog ownership and, and the, the relationship between handler and dog. There is there's the two people that I've asked to contribute is my good friend Kat Farrance, who's going to um, come on and you're going to get to meet her shortly. And also Christina Ashley, who is a, um, a social worker and specialist in mental health, who also is a professional counsellor who works a lot with therapy and with people um, that have anxiety um, concerns or mental health concerns, et cetera. The, the missing link that I feel when I've worked with clients really pers uh, extensively, um, that they, whilst I can help them a lot with the dog training, I felt that we needed to support them to, and build their confidence. I talked about the impact of PTSD and how that when you have a dog that has a behavioral issue, how that could be an underlying issue that could affect you being able to resolve the problem. As a part of this course, I wanted to get people that specialize in that in that world and that could help people and contribute um, uh, exercises that you can do to help yourself gain confidence. So I'm gonna invite Kat Farrance. Um, she is the um, CEO of Mood Movement for Modern Life, an online yoga um, business that she set up and Kat has a fantastic story of how she got into that which I'll let you, her share with you I'm gonna just share Kat's screen there she is oh hello Kat you want to come on excellent thank you for your patience Kat thank you for joining and obviously for contributing um Kat is a really good friend and also she's a she's um a, a dog trainer and she competes in obedience and she's venturing into IGP with her and you with her homebred Australian Shepherds. Um, I thought they'd make an appearance, but never mind. Um, oh, here's, and, yeah, Gracie's here, but she's busy biting another dog. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. Say that for the blooper reels, Kat. <laughs> but um, I wanted Kat to get involved because I felt that, as I said, it was about self care and, and well being. And yoga is a great way of looking at that. You know, that Kat's got a fantastic story how she got into yoga and the impact it's had on her life and I wanted to share that with people on this course so Kat has she'll tell you a bit about what she's contributed but just give us a little bit of insight into your journey into yoga and how it's helped you as an individual and how you feel it can help others oh wow um big thing okay so I've been practicing yoga since I was 18 I basically came to it because it was a it's non-competitive I was one of those crappy kids at school who couldn't do any sports mm -hmm. and as a result you know I was like last to be picked on the team so as a result I always felt that you know my body was a sort of distance away from myself I had a pretty um unhappy relationship with with myself mm -hmm. and with yoga I discovered that I was able to move breathe I didn't have to compare myself to anybody else and feel good um, and it was really um, magical. And to be honest, for me, what yoga is, is it's breathing, moving and coming into a headspace where we're becoming conscious, noticing what we're doing. It's that thing of, ah, oh, I can put my right foot forward. And if I put my left foot this far back, then I feel a little bit different here. And it's becoming very aware about our body how our body affects our mind, how our mind affects the body, how the breath affects our mind and body. Um, so it's, it's for me been a sort of a 
a few decades now of just um, self-inquiry mm -hmm. and it's been uh, um, a really useful tool and for me for me it's kind of it has come into its own with dog sports to be honest because um, I'm a very anxious sort of um, yeah I, I'm I, I'm a full-on sort of person. I, I I get naturally quite um, obsessive, quite anxious. I'm if I was a dog, I'd probably be a neurotic collie, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit nippy. <laughs> so I find that yoga is something that really helps to keep a lid on it. And I think without it, I would probably be in a loony asylum or something. It's really, really helpful as a tool. And for me, so how do you how do you feel though that when you um, that your anxiety levels? How do you feel it detrimentally affects your dog's behaviour then? And how would that relate to people with dogs with reactivity issues, for example? Right. Yeah, absolutely, massively. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I found is my dogs. I've got Australian Shepherds, and they're super sensitive dogs. In as much as they're very aware of how I'm feeling, and their feelings will mirror mine. Mm -hmm. And if I don't control my mind, if I don't take the time to really consider mm -hmm. how what my way of being is going to be at that moment, mm -hmm. I know that it's going to leak into the dog. Okay. And it's like a question for me of um, having to contain it at, at all times and be really aware mm -hmm. of what my energy is giving. And especially when it comes to something like competing, you know, if I'm going to ask my dog to do a ticket round, I've got to be aware of what I'm giving her if I'm asking her to give something of me. Mm -hmm. And the Aussies, you know, they're no shrinking violets as well. You know, we do have issues mm -hmm. with the strong bitches here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's just that question of me checking myself. Mm -hmm. Like, Is my heart rate up? Yeah. How's yeah. my breathing? Yeah. How's my body? What, what's my body language? And the nice thing about yoga is you get to practice things on the mat so that when a situation happens in life, you then have some tools to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. There's so many parallels between dog sports and the preparation needed for dog sports to dealing with behavior and that connection again, coming back to the relationship. Um, so just briefly, tell us a little bit about, obviously I asked you to, to get involved in this project, what you've contributed, and uh, so that a little bit glimpse into what you you've um, you've, yeah. Uh, you've done. Yeah. So for me, it was the importance. It was um, a little a, a little bit about the importance of visualizing, of managing our mind, of not letting our mind sort of run roughshod over us, mm -hmm. of finding techniques in order that, you know, in the same way that we're like, okay, I'm going to be disciplined with what I eat. I'm going to be disciplined with how I conduct myself in public, how my face, I'm not gonna just say the things, but it's exactly the same with what we think. And we have to become, um, you know, it, it is how to cultivate that awareness. So it's a little bit about mindfulness tricks and tips, yeah. how to start to cultivate a sense of awareness and also some breathing techniques, because what I've found is that with breathing, you can really come back into your body. And when you're in your body, you're not in your head, you're not anxious, you're not reacting, you're not worried, you're not thinking, oh my goodness, there's a big dog over there, my dog's gonna do this, da 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 da, -da which is setting off a chain in your head, which is definitely gonna set off your dog. Absolutely. You're actually just, okay, I'm in my body, mm -hmm. I'm aware of what's going on. So it's these little techniques, and if we can learn how to cultivate our breathing, um, again, as we are feeling relaxed, as we're feeling calm, then come the exciting, scary, anxiety-making situation, we should be able to um, manage it better because it's it becomes a practice response. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he, I was super, as I said, I felt that what the course needed was people that had an expertise in well-being and, and um uh, mental management, if you want to call it, and just mm -hmm. self-awareness. And Kat was most definitely the obvious contributor. She's, um, uh, again, she's been a yoga practitioner for an extensive period of time. She's had her own, um, again, personal um, challenges and struggles with anxiety that she's overcome by the medium of yoga and her self-awareness. And that's something that I feel is really, really valid for those people that have dogs that are reactive and being aware of ourselves 
and learning to control ourselves and how we're feeling. Are we feeling anxious? Are we feeling apprehensive? Because that most definitely will, will impact the dog's behavior. Um, Kat, as always, a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much for contributing to this course. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, again, when part of the course and those that partake in the course, um, the experts in that have contributed in your meeting tonight uh, are also going to be contributing um, various entities throughout the year. What Kat has very graciously done for anybody that signs up for the course and is in part of the Relabeling Reactivity Collective, which I'm going to talk about next week. Um, she's also going to give some great um, bonuses and, and additions too. When we're going to, I'm going to give you a little bit more information about that. Post this, I will share Kat's um, uh, website details on the uh, the conversation. So you can, again, you can check out Kat and the amazing work that she's doing. She's actually now amazingly helping the NHS. So Kat's team are now working with the NHS as a result of, you know, all that's been gone in this crazy year to give them the resource and access to yoga, which to me just really articulates how powerful um, something like yoga, which a lot of, you know, even myself, I would be skeptical about how impactful it is and how I've changed even my perception of. And if it's good enough for the U NHS, it's good enough for us. So thank you very much, Kat. I love and best wishes as always. So thank you very much. All right, guys. So we're going to keep the momentum up and I'm going to introduce you because I'm just mindful of the time zone and um, uh, her commitment to this project is uh, uh, Christina Ashley. So I'm going to just bring her on. Just bear with me. Um, and she, her, her, da, 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 let me just add her to the spotlight. Here we go. So hi, Christina. Thank you very much for your patience. I know that your time is precious, so I'm going to hit the ground running. So Christina, it, this, uh, our meeting and her involvement in this project came out really, really organically in that I'd actually spoken to Kat about her role in this project. And I said, oh, it'd really be great if we could get somebody that had um, an experience in therapy and mental health and had that expertise under their belt that would come into this project. And I just put it out in the universe and that's how the universe works, people. Um, Kat was like, yeah, that'd be amazing. I'll see if I, you know, if I can come up with anybody. And I was, you know, I contacted various people and it never um, come to anything. What then sp spookily happened is Christina had actually contacted me to do an online lesson. So can Christina lives in the States and she's going to give a little insight to that. And she had a dog that she wanted help with from training for obedience. And when I went to look at um, uh, her Facebook profile, I was like, oh, Christina. And I, and I sort of like tentatively inquired about, oh, what is it that you do for your job? And it was just like, if I had written down on paper what I wanted the person that was could input into this, um, this project to have in terms of experience and what they did, it was like Christina took the information out of my mind and, and turned up. So I'm hugely honored for you to be part of this, Christina. Um, how are you doing? And thank you very much for being part of this. So just introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm very honored to have been asked. And it is, you're totally right, how the universe works. It's, it's amazing to see. Um, as you said, I'm from the States and I'm a licensed social worker who specializes in mental health disorders and substance abuse disorders. I have worked with a variety of different populations ranging from um, the forensic populations to uh, with people that have uh, mental health disorders that have led them to commit some type of um, horrific act in their life to the intellectually disabled population, to people that um, are in the elderly population, um, homicidal, suicidal, psychosis. I evaluated them to see if they needed to be hospitalized or not. And more recently, I went into private practice working with um, people with a variety of different uh, mental health disorders, ranging from every day-to-day -day stress to adjusting to different things in their life to um, schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder. So. Um, Helping people with their mental health is a huge passion of mine, as well as working with um, dogs. And um, so it's just, I'm really happy to be a part and um, help you guys. Yeah, awesome. So obviously I, I wanted somebody that had, again, the credentials to be part of this project because whilst I'm a dog trainer and I can give you my personal life experience and there is a contribution or an entity that I deliver on um, the, the mental aspect of um, you know, dealing with um, anxiety from a competing and a sports coaching perspective, I wanted somebody with that expertise in, in more dealing with 
when you have like anxiety issues. Now, Christine obviously is a, that's what she does on a daily basis, working with people that have um, anxiety, concerns, et cetera, that really I felt would be a valid input to help people and away from the dog training. This is the stuff that Kat and Christina can bring to the table that can really help you move forward from this. So Christina, just give us a little, little bit of insight. I'm just very mindful of your time um, of what you've contributed to the project and um, your role with in it? So um, some different things that I've contributed to the Relabeling Reactivity Project is a wide variety. We take a look at how um, different scenarios, kind of like what we mentioned here today from the stories, how it makes us feel, how other people around us make us feel, whether it be positive or negative, especially when owning a reactive dog. And um, I'm going to be giving you guys some different tools and techniques to um, help cope with those different emotions that you're um, feeling to harness your behaviors a little bit better so they won't correlate as much or contribute to your dog's reactivity because there's been a lot of um, evidence based research that has shown that um, people that have um, mental health issues or are struggling with every day-to-day -day stress can definitely contribute to um, their dog's reactivity. Kind of like what um, Kat mentioned earlier about the mirroring. That's one of the techniques that's um, definitely um, a theory that's used. And we're also gonna be looking at some different biological type of aspects such as hormones that we release. Um, a lot of um, dog people might be familiar with the fight, flight, or freeze aspect well us humans also experience stuff like that and those are some different things that we're going to be um, taking a look at as well amazing I, again it was just as i said i put it out in the universe and as i say christina turned up I, i'm just mindful christina has a client that she has to see shortly so i don't want to take too much of her time um so again as i mentioned earlier each of the experts are going to be involved moving forward so it's not a case of that's it full stop you're never going to see christina again i've asked all the um uh the contributors to be part of this project for to support everybody over the forthcoming year that this course is going to be run and then moving forward. So Christina is going to be doing like the other expert additional content that's going to be available in the collective group, which I'm going to talk about again next week. Um, so again, massive, massive, massive thanks to Christina. I, I, I'm really, really excited about what you have to bring to the table and how it's going to complement what we've put together. Christina, I'm going to love you and leave you. I know you've got to go. So I'll let you go. And um, I'm going to open up to questions from everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take I appreciate care. it, everybody. And I look forward to working with you all. Take care. Speak Bye bye. Soon. OK, so you've now met all the people that have contributed to this course and it, hopefully it's, you can pick up on the fact that it's going to be something that I'm really, really passionate about. And I hope it's going to really, really help people. I know there's a plethora of questions that people have. Um, I'm going to try and scroll through them on my phone. So bear with me whilst I, I disconnect from uh, looking at the, the, the screen. Um, and I'm sure if you have questions, by all means, ask them. So I'm just going to go back. I don't know if I can access them all oh, let's have a look so i know that one of the questions um was about that you heard patricia and ian's story and i'm sure everybody you know there was comments and there was really really heartwarming to see how everybody picked up on the genuine the the connection that they they have with their dog and i'm sure that a lot of the messaging or the the things that they said resonated with people one of the comments that was made was how well, what those people have all worked with me in person how is that going to affect in online training so whether you, you may or may not know that I um, teach a lot online and I teach across the world online and I and I have students from across the globe that um, that I work with on a regular basis online and I've actually found that online training is such an effective medium of connecting with somebody and it's not to substitute in person um, training if that's possible but for a lot of people that isn't possible so what I'd offer to them is to give them explicit information via the medium of the online platform or the website which they can follow so they can go away and do the work and come back to me and connect with me and an, um, a, a, a check-in points and that's how it works from a sports perspective I should say for relabeling reactivity the course has been put together with making it really really simple to follow I didn't want to make it too heavy with you know ha people having to access other people's help to um to get a middle of per to create re perfect situations because I know that isn't practical um for most people to access the perfect stooge dog to get somebody to help them it was about really equipping the person with the skills to be able to move forward 
The things that is covered in the course are the things that I work with Dylan and Patricia. So it's just a case that they would access me on a weekly basis in a class, but they would go away and do the work independently, utilizing and implementing the things that I um, and the techniques that I um, suggested for them. So in terms of the online course, the course is based on everything that Patricia and Dylan um, were taught in a class and it's just condensed into an online um, entity. Now I say condensed, the course currently has over a hundred videos. Okay, that's a lot people, so bear with me. Okay, which is gonna be staggered in its release because I absolutely get that can be information overload. So there's a hundred videos of content and it's going to be growing because I'm gonna be adding more stuff to that. Um, from and obviously the other experts are going to be adding content to that as well. So whilst it is great if you have the medium of accessing, if you can, you know, follow up uh, the stuff on the course and, you know, come on a seminar idea, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the agenda of the course. The course, the online course is, is designed in a way that you can work through this, the exercises and do it solely on your own with no other help from other people necessarily until you build up your confidence by the means of the training the techniques and also the the self-awareness and self-help stuff eventually that the final piece of the puzzle would be if you could access me on a, in a live one-to-one -one basis or in a class or in a seminar but it isn't a necessity to make the um to glean um from the project and it's been very very much designed with that in mind because i absolutely get that you know a lot of times um when you're working with reactive dogs, it's the, quite a, the perfect stooge dog, the perfect still environment, etc. And it's all about real world training. And there is an entity on, on the course where you literally, as I say, talk, see me walking one of my dogs in a public space where I see people with prams and dogs, etc. Situations that could quite easily be problematic and how I deal with those in those situations. All right. Um, so I'm going to just have a look at um, questions, if there's any more questions. Yours are wonderful to bonus questions. Da, da, da. I used to go to ring. Oh. Yeah, great point, Jackie. A, a, a lifetime of, um, I think some dogs are lifetime of management to some degree. Mine is, although he's amazing now, there's always those moments when he's likely to react because of how he's feeling, just to read and recognize those moments. That's the thing to reiterate. And it's that Disney esque mentality we have to dogs. Dogs are not meant to be to love everything not respond to um to um um anything they're not meant to be robots they're not meant to be cuddly toys it's perfectly normal yet yeah, for your dog to go i don't like that other dog or i don't like that i'm a bit concerned that doesn't make your dog a problem and all of us as responsible dog owners should have an entity where we manage our dog's behaviors so i was walking my dogs today just to give you an example i saw somebody um a couple walking their three dogs I had my dogs loose. I called my dogs back and I made them wait and sit with me. I did that not because my dogs were a problem, but I'm sure those people didn't want to be surrounded by all my dogs and I didn't want my dogs going up to them. I managed their behavior. The, their dogs were perfectly, beautifully behaved and so were mine. That doesn't mean my dogs are good, bad or indifferent. It means that's courtesy for, for fellow dog walkers. And management is something that I, I think everybody should consider. The goal is to have the minimal amount of management and hopefully having our dogs so confident and, and solid in most situations that they can navigate life with minimal amount of problems. All right. Um, Jill made a comment about I'd love to be able to take them out without feeling I'm constantly in training mode. So initially, definitely, you're going to be if I had a puppy. Um, so if I had a puppy now, the first year of their life, if not 18 months, is going to be in training mode. So I, I, that's a part and parcel I'm going to be thinking about the environments they're going in I'm going to think about the experiences they have I'm going to think about the situations that they're being exposed to I'm going to experience think about that that's part and parcel of owning a dog and rearing it to be a well-adjusted adult it's you you earn the right to say okay I can let the dog off the lead and largely it's going to be safe however the caveat to that is you can't even if your dog is um, um, absolutely brilliant. I'm still always respectful of other people because I don't want to be the person that's shouting across the park. Oh, he's friendly. He just wants to say hello, which is, you know, the, the words that resonate with us all and send a, a, a cold stake into our heart. Um, but it's something that 
is really, really critically to understand. It's not to create a dog that goes, yeah, great, I can be in a crowd of dogs and if a dog bites me, I'm gonna turn up. That's not what the course is about. And the course is most definitely not about, here's a magic wand, I can fix your dog because there is nothing to fix. It's about giving you the skills, um, giving the dog the skills and equipping you with some personal skills that you can implement to change the way your dog lives its life. Uh, I wanna be really, really implicitly clear. I All the people that, have worked with me and you've heard their dialogues and you've heard their conversation, they were committed to the process as was I. So the project has been, as I say, years in the making. So I've really committed to this process as have all the contributors. And I, that's why I ask anybody that's considering joining, just be committed to the process. And uh, again, um, you know, um, take the lessons on board and, and be per have perseverance and accept that you're gonna have ups and downs. Like Patricia talked about, like Dylan talked about, it's not just right, okay, I come to Kamal Fernandes, I'm gonna start his training and off I go. That's the natural progression of owning a dog and the relationship we have is very much about an up and down, but it's having the skills and the support system behind you to be able to move forward, all right? So, um, give me hope, Lou. Can I physiotherapy? I am a vet physio. I agree. Pain can most may definitely become very reactive. Absolutely, yeah, definitely, Karen. I think that's something that often is overlooked. That is the dog physically well. That's something really, really, really great point. Um, okay, I'm just reading through the comments to see if there's any more questions. I know there's a couple on the Zoom chat. How long do you access the material for? Is it lifetime access so you can revert back to in the future? So, Jody, the course, um, when you subscribe to the course, I'm going to go over this more next week. I'm just mindful of the time. It's been a really long evening for everybody. The course is you get, initially you subscribe, you'll get 12 months access, and then there's a renewal every year. If you want to be part of the collective, again, same principle, you can upgrade to get in that access. And that's where you're part of a private Facebook group in which you're going to get additional content. And um, I will be doing regular um, lives and webinars, as will the other contributors, contributors, I should say, um, to help you that year process. Um, the idea is that we're going to support you in that year. Yeah. Um, so it, it isn't about you um, getting f direct feedback and posting video. That isn't what the course is about. The course is being created to be so extensive and so um, covered all bases that you should be able to, if you want to just self-study, you're more than capable to, uh, able to. Um, but if you wanted to um, partake in more exclusive stuff and, and additional content, then you can subscribe to the collective. But again, all the pricings and stuff like that, I'm going to go in next week and I'm going to be releasing information about next week. Um, so bear with me on that. I'm just mindful of getting through your questions about reactivity. OK, um, bu -bu 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 let's have a look. OK, so so refreshing to hear people's stories about. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I'm going to go in. I've talked a bit about that. I'm going to talk about costings because we're working at making sure that it's affordable and there's a price plan, etc. So I'm going to give all that information out next week. So just bear with me on that. Um, excellent. I'm just going to check if this is a Zoom chat um, for I think there was a couple of questions on there. OK. Do you think that is more common? Do you think? OK, that's a really so I have a question. Oh, hang on. I think on the Zoom chat, there was, do you think that reactivity is more common in dogs more now more than 10 years ago? Sue, why? I, I think it's more common because I think we've coined the phrase reactivity. 30 years ago, we never had reactive dogs. We had fearful dogs, nervous dogs, aggressive dogs. And what I'm urging people is to ditch the label, relabel reactivity and look at your dog as what it is. My dog is fearful. Okay, then if it's fearful, let's give the dog confidence. Let's build its confidence up so it's no longer fearful. If the dog is um, motion sensitive, if it's reacting to movement um, and it reacts to a cyclist, let's equip the dog with impulse control skills so that the dog can, can, can be in a situation where there's a fast moving thing in front of it and the dog understands not to respond to that. I don't think it's that we have more reactive dogs. I think it's that that's the label that encompasses so many behaviors that by the sheer, there is, you know, when you've got aggression, fear, uh, motion sensitive, et cetera, all lumped into one heading, of course, there's going to be more en masse. Um, and what I'm urging people is to think differently about these dogs, not only if, if you have one, but if you know somebody, and when I did the questionnaire, I asked the question, do you know somebody that has a dog that's deemed as reactive? There was an over staggering percentage, it was something like 98 point something percent, if not more. 
So most of us know a dog that has been called reactive. And how can we be more compassionate? How can we be more understanding of that person's challenges so that we can help them um, move forward? You know, that, and again, it comes back to my lifting ships um, uh, uh, podcast and YouTube clips. A rising tide lifts all ships. If we can support each other and be understanding and compassionate, that's going to avoid that person having that um, trauma and, and it resonating with them and it um, um, and it being a stigma attached to them because it, that could one day be me. That could one day be the person next to me. So it's just having compassion and kindness for all, okay? Um, so Jamie asked, do you think the prenatal stress could have a factor in the dog's reactivity? The mother's being a stressful environment with constant high levels of stress hormones circulate in their bodies while carrying puppies. Does this affect um, this possibly affect? In truth, Jamie, I don't know. What I would say was a bigger contributing factor of a, a dog um, uh, prenatal stress would be the dog's temperament genetically. I would say that would be a bigger factor. So I have had dogs that, um, you know, weren't, um, you know, didn't have any interaction, wasn't as if they didn't think particularly, they didn't do any stringent program over in them. And they had the most amazing, amazing temperaments because their genetics were really sound. Um, I've had dogs that, um, or I've seen dogs that have followed a stringent process of being reared absolutely beautifully and the bitch was immaculately cared for and the dog still had poor temperaments because genetically they had weak temperaments. I would say in my experience that genetics most definitely, if the dog is genetically sound, it's almost like it doesn't matter what you do within reason, um, the dog will still be fine. But those dogs are, to be fair, more few and far between because now breeding dogs is much more of a commercial entity. You know, when you're in the current climate, you know, a dog could be several thousands of pounds. Um, so I think that's changed the, the motives for people. Like, and, you know, you regularly, I talked about this previously in one of my blogs, you would have, you know, um, the local mutt that was a concoction of all the dogs in the area. And those dogs tended to be a mixture of all the dogs in the locality. And they tended to be, you know, a bit of a Heinz 57, generally robust, good temperament, but it was almost like the environment created it. So I would say genetics is most definitely, and I'm really, really particular about genetics and certainly the dogs that I breed on from and, and the dogs that I look for in that the dogs have, to, you have to be able to live with them. I don't want a dog that, um, um, that people have problems with and have, issues with now, now that isn't to say that the dogs that I breed don't have the potential to be problematic um, because they're border collies as I discussed the other day but it's to say they certainly aren't coming out with a hardwired predisposition to be fearful or uh, uh, or apprehensive that isn't certainly within their their genetic makeup um, so yeah that would be my input on that in the program, how can you tailor the things you do to the specific needs of your individual dog? So the course is so comprehensive. Um, I talk about within the course about the five variations of um, or types of reactivity and the course of action um, that would be applicable. That whilst training could be tailor made to the individual, the one, the course is so vast, but a lot of the stuff, it's about teaching some core skills and then building on those core skills. So if your dog, for example, is food motivated you can substitute the lessons and use food if your dog is fearful or apprehensive um then you can um adapt the some of the techniques and that's just this uh, that's uh, discussed um so it's applicable you might have a bigger distance and remain at that bigger distance and so forth and so forth but the the core information and the teaching is applicable to all dogs and to anybody that's um wants to join it isn't a case of you have to be uh, um you know how be an experienced dog owner dog trainer the idea is it's set out in a very simplistic manner so that anybody can follow the program and follow the the, the teachings um there's check there's sort of a, uh, a knowledge checking entity to it so you can make sure that you're picking up the pertinent points um but it, the idea is that it's been it's hence why i talked about dylan's input i got i spoke a lot with him as somebody that had been in that position what is it that you would want and i talked to loads of people in that position if you could have an online entity what would you want it to cover and the key things was it had to be simple to follow it had to be cover um the things that you could do on your own without the necessity of having a second dog or second person or the perfect scenario and also real world training so that's what's really been um covered and with it in mind all right so i'm gonna um just go finally if there's any questions on the facebook chat um and if there's any on the zoom let's just have a look i'll just make sure Okay, or well, I think we've 
I've gone through all the questions. I, so true, true about core skills and getting owners to relax to let their process begin. Yeah, absolutely. So I probably have missed some of your questions. If I have, I will scroll back over and I will um, um, I'll pick them up. So uh, apologies if that is. It's sometimes again the technology um, can be a little bit challenging. Um, bum, 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 shuts down rather than stress. Well, dogs that shut down rather than react. So it's just benefit. So uh, Kathy, I'm just going to pick up your question. Will dogs that shut down rather than react in those stressful situations still benefit? So I, I just to qualify, and I should have done this at the beginning of the conversation, was this course is designed for dogs that have um, are more um, that have traits that are deemed reactive and then take action moving forward. So they display something that's inappropriate. If a dog, and it's not to deal with dogs that are, uh, for example, if a dog jumps on your dog's head and your dog says, don't sit on my head, that's not in my opinion what a reactive dog is. In the same vein, if your dog is scared of fireworks, that isn't what this course is designed for. I wanna be really, really clear about that. And I'm gonna again, go over that next week a little bit more. But if your dog is stressful and shut down, um, because of the situation, this course definitely will work on confidence um, and slowly building your dog's confidence up with other entities. But again, it focuses on giving the dog skill and giving you skills, which will ultimately affect um, uh, the dog's response. So yes, that will be covered. It hasn't. I haven't got a shut down dog that I show you um, it, specifically going. Um, uh, I wouldn't put a dog in that situation, but I definitely share with you, for example, uh, experiences Sugar, my little Jack Russell cross. Um, who was a dog that was absolutely predisposed to shutting down and how, you know, things that I did with her built her confidence and other dogs that I've owned that are similar that I, I'll share with you how you can build their resilience and confidence up. Again, a dog that shuts down is because it probably lacks a bit of resilience and tenacity and we need to create that and confidence. So that's definitely covered in the course. All right. OK, let me just have a quick look. Just final questions. Um. No, lots of comments. But my dog. Oh, hang on. Will any of the content address obedience and agility competition dogs and the environments that to deal with, or mainly pet ownership in general environments? So yeah, the course is designed to again coming back to it. It isn't a case of right. It's just ex explicitly for pet dogs or sports dogs. It's a generic course that gives the handler skills and the dog skills that they can take into any environment. Obviously, sports environments are much more challenging because there's a higher density of dogs and people that needs to be considered as part of the process. And it also gives the handler, which is a huge entity of this course, the key skills to recognize when they're feeling anxious, um, um, etc. cetera, um, that they're feeling anxious, they're feeling concerned and how they can help themselves. So that's a huge part of the course. Um, so is it specifically for sports or um, domestic dogs? It's a generic course and it's been designed in that manner. All right. So final questions. I think I missed somebody's question there before I, but my dog me scared, hide, but then snap and bite. Yeah, Vanessa, confidence. Yeah, the course is most definitely aimed at dogs that are lacking confidence. Um, so giving you a skill set to build the dog's confidence, building the dog's confidence up by the exercises that we cover and also working on your confidence with the dogs. So again, um, there's so much information in the course that it will tap on all the variations of reactivity or the, the, the one, the core issues that can create it. And then most importantly, giving the dog and you the skills to be able to move forward within that. All right, guys, I know this has gone on longer than intended. It's been a very, very popular evening. You know, several hundred people have watched either on Facebook or joined um, the Zoom call. I want to just draw things to a close by first and foremost, thanking those of you that have partaken and watched on at home um first and foremost and thank you for your patience with the technology i really really do appreciate it i know that it can be sometimes a, a testing thing when you're trying to watch a video and it cuts out etc um I, I that's somewhat out of my control with the you know the internet these things happen i'm sure we've all experienced it so thank you for your patience with that Secondly, I want to thank all the people that have contributed to the course. They have been absolutely amazing through this whole process. When I said I wanted to put this project together, um, they were the obvious choices and, and, and how they, their contribution and their work behind the scenes has been amazing. And, and certainly the team that I've got behind me that have helped me 
um alex for putting it all together has been absolutely amazing and and all the various entities to it it's been fantastic i'm so grateful i hope that this evening has been insightful and um, informative first and foremost and the thing to say is that i'm absolutely that some people are not going to join the course some people are i hope that the lives i've done this week and i'm going to be doing stuff next week it just gives you um, confidence and hope that you can move through forward through this notion of reactivity and you can change your dog's um, thinking on it. Uh, this is not just about me saying I've got this course and you know jump on board and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. It's about saying to you, you know, it is possible to help your dog gain confidence and therefore move forward. All right, guys, I've we've gone on. It's been a really long evening. I'm sure you guys are ready for uh, of a bed. Um, I've got to go and sort the dogs out. So I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you very much for partaking. And um, as I say, the, the recording will be on Facebook in the next couple of days. Just bear with me whilst I edit, etc. Um, and thank you for your participation. All right, everybody. Good evening. Take care.